You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. AirPods Pro with adaptive audio. Automatically keeps out the sounds you don't want to hear so you can listen to your music. And lowers your music to let in the sounds you do need to hear. Hi there. Hi, what can I get you? I'll have a strawberry mango coconut probiotic smoothie with wheatgrass. Anything else? Extra wheatgrass. Here you go. AirPods Pro with adaptive audio. Available on AirPods Pro second generation when enabled. This episode is brought to you by State Farm. From your morning podcast to your afternoon playlist, State Farm knows you personalize your entire day. And that's why State Farm helps you personalize your insurance with the State Farm Personal Price Plan. It offers coverage options that help protect what you care about most at an affordable price just for you. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Prices vary by state. Options selected by customer. Availability and eligibility may vary. You, you feel this this nervousness on the phone there? Sir, I've been trying to make an urgent phone call up there. Well, I don't think it's something I want to do on an overseas phone. You got to make some phone calls. Hang up the phone. Prank call. Prank call. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to Packernet After Dark. This is the call-in show of the Packernet Podcast Network. If you'd like to call in, if you'd like to participate in the show, please feel free to do so. Phone number here is 608-501-0718. New callers go directly to the front of the line. We don't have any new callers today, so why don't we check in with Goose? Hey, Ryan. Goose here. Hey, Goose. I'm just calling because people are going in pretty hard on Gudikum, is what I'm seeing. And if you defend him at all, you get all the goot litter. And how dare you defend him? He's the worst GM ever. And I just. People think he's the worst to step back and take a bigger view of what other GMs are doing. And what other teams have looked like because to, the Packers have not had a bad game very long time. And I understand why people are upset because this team is doing that and that's upsetting. And they don't like the players and that the Packers are sticking with them. And people really don't like the Razul move. Uh, I reacted badly when it first happened to because I loved Rizul on this team and he's just a great guy and he's done some amazing things for the Packers and he's playing well. But the truth of it is, is this team is not competing this year. This is an year. Valuation so far has been that this team is not good and they are going to have to rebuild. But to sit back and say who comes as a bad GM, like, look at the difference between 2017 and 20, 2017, 2018, and 2019, 2020. Good comes came in in 2018. He gave the party the year to prove he was high. The car. So, Hang in there, Goose. What did they do? They got rid of a whole bunch of. All right. <laughs> I tried, Goose. Um, <clears throat> he's got a couple other calls, so we'll see what else he has to add. But um, Goose is calling from Canada, and I know he has to pay per call, so I want to make sure that. Um, I try to at least get through as much of that as I can, but it sounded like we were completely losing you. But I, I, I think we got the general theme. And like I said, I'm trying to be open-minded about stuff. I know I come into this as somebody who liked Gutekunst. I'm also somebody who came into this saying I'm a big fan of Matt LaFleur, and I'm starting to change my mind. I came into this defending um, Joe Barry, and, and now I'm changing my mind. I came into this defending Jordan Love, and I'm now changing my mind. A couple of years ago, I was an ardent Aaron Rodgers supporter, and I changed my mind. It's it's, I'm very flexible and willing to take in information. And if I think we've um, 
if I think something has changed, then I will change my mind. But I have not really heard any rational, uh, I shouldn't say it that way. I, I haven't heard anything that has moved me. I mean, I, I get what the counterpoints are. And you're right. The whole goot liquor thing is just, it's like, okay, great. I mean, that obviously that has no bearing on uh, helping me change my mind, which is all you're going to get if you go on social media. The There, there is a contingent of anti guttacons people. There, there, there's all these like camps, but there are like hardcore people in each group. Like there's the hardcore Jordan Love supporters, Jordan Love haters, guttacons haters. And it's like, it's funny because I never see those people, like the anti guttacons people. And then you say something and it's like, oh yeah, I remember you guys. <laughs> They come out and and it's just, uh, but yeah, it's it's a lot of like, well, you just, well, you know, and he can do no wrong and blah, blah. It's like, all right, I don't want to have this conversation. Now we're just getting into stupid nonsense. Like, you know, say your piece and we'll see where it sits. And so far what I've heard, it, it doesn't, it doesn't move me again. I, I think for a lot of people, number one, they have a different assessment of the team, right? For, for a lot of fans, it's like, if you give up on this team, you're not a real fan. Well, Gutekunst came in, he's like, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I'm kind of out on this a little bit. So for some people that's, that's bothersome. Like how, how dare you? We, we need a little bit of help and we'll be okay. It's like, well, okay. Your assessment, I could see you being frustrated, but I, I don't think that that's the right assessment. It's same with like Josh Myers, like that, what Gutekunst said about him doesn't fit a lot of people's assessments. So they don't like him. Like that's not my assessment. Okay. But as far as the Razul thing specifically, it's like the, the most compelling argument i think is is the locker room argument but it it still falls flat because there's never a good time to it's the same with the aaron Rodgers thing like it's it's on its face it seems to make sense but if you really dig in below the surface there's no substance here like aaron Rodgers did not like the way uh people went out right like he, he got upset because some people weren't even made an offer and that's disrespectful but yet jordy was made an offer but the offer was disrespectful so the bottom line is, you just have to keep all the guys that, that have done so much for the team. Bullcrap. And in Razul's case, it's like, well, he, he's a leader in the locker room. It's like, okay, first of all, sometimes that happens, right? There, there's a lot of guys who have been leader. I mean, Mercedes Lewis was a leader, and they let him go. Should he have stayed? For how long? Is there a limit to how long, or is it just as long as you are a leader, you get to stay? And we have to use up resources and roster spots to keep you. So that's not a massively compelling argument, because it's not enough. It's not just if you have good leadership skills. I mean, there are, there are probably, you know, 60-year-old ex-players that would be great leaders, but you don't put them on your team. So just the fact that you are a leader and people like you in, in the locker room doesn't mean anything. Beyond that, again, the locker room is a disaster right now as far as the demeanor. And that is something that needs to be rebuilt in and of itself. So yeah, in, in the short term, people are going to be upset. Boo frickin' who? Guess what? Next year, they come back all revitalized and ready to rock and roll. And you know what? A bunch of other guys are going to be gone, and a lot of people are going to be upset about those people being gone. Oh, well. Some people are going to leave. Some new people are going to come in. It is what it is. You're either here, and you're excited, and you're motivated to move forward with the team, or you throw a hissy fit. But, you know, that it's just, it's not massively compelling. Like, I don't care if he's good, because that doesn't factor in to what we're trying to do right now. This is not about 2023. And I'm sorry, players are not coaches. You don't keep players around because they're going to coach. And when has that ever happened, by the way? Like, we talk about that all the time. When, can you point me to one example? Show me how Mercedes Lewis helped out the tight ends. That never happened. Nobody got better at anything. Tight ends sucked. Show me how Devontae helped out the, the other wide receivers. He didn't. Devontae was great. The other receivers were not. How did anybody help anybody? I'm sorry, I'm not paying somebody $12 million a year to just hang out and like, you know, you know, after you lose a game because you suck and nobody cares, you kind of pull them under your wing and you're like, hey man, we got to really dig deep. No, that's... So again, I, I, I'll listen, but everything I've heard so far is just not good enough. This is, this is a multi-year rebuild and we're not hanging on to guys for multiple years because we like their their veteran status. So Kenny's got to stay. Preston's got to stay. Aaron's got to stay. Razul's got to stay. Uh, Mercedes Lewis needed to stay. Devondre's got to stay. I mean, what do we do if we find out Savage is a, is a core piece of the locker room? Does he have to stay? I'm not saying he is, but what, what, what if we had heard that it was Darnell Savage who was quote-unquote holding court at his locker room? Does he have to stay now? Is that all it takes to win a job on a football team is to like be a be a vocal person in the locker room and try to rally the troops and then you get to stay. 
No, the reality is this this is a selling team right now. You had your opportunity to prove that you're a good football team. You didn't do that. And so now guys go bye-bye. And, you know, the plan was to probably wait until the end of the year, see how it, it pans out. A lot of the guys end up leaving after the season as a part of this teardown. But since we got an offer now for more than we ever expected to get for a guy that we pulled off a practice squad, which, by the way, it's also weird to to try to use Razul Douglas against Brian Gutekunst, the guy that brought in Razul Douglas off a practice squad. Yeah, that that that's really going to sway me off of Brian Gutekunst. <laughs> he's the only reason he's here. We literally got paid to rent Razul Douglas for like three years. It's like if you needed to build a dollhouse for your kid. So you go to a garage sale and you buy tools for $10, you build the dollhouse, and then you sell it for 20 bucks. Or in this case, you, you basically got it for free, and then you sold it for 50 bucks after you used it. And so you're an idiot. You should have kept the tools. I'm like, okay, well, whatever. <laughs> Built a sweet dollhouse, and I made 50 bucks. But yeah, I guess I'm a stupid idiot. Let's goose again. Hey. Um, continuing my thought. Uh, 2019 was not just Rogers. Rogers was, in fact, a lot of people were questioning if he was done, if he was over the hill. Well, and, and again, people that want to say that is, is just, should, should I go through it? Do we have to go through it? It's like, well, it wasn't Gutekunst, it was Rodgers. Okay. So left guard Elton Jenkins had no bearing on the success of the season. Sidarius Smith, who is one of the best pass rushers in the entire NFL with a 90 PFF grade, who is a rotational backup and the best player on our defense, one of the best players in the entire NFL. That had no bearing on the guy that we brought in here. Adrian Amos, who is one of the top safeties who was brought in here. Within like seven safeties got picked up, we got Adrian Amos. Jair Alexander had nothing to do. And remember, we're still purging bad players. Montrevious Adams was one of our defensive tackles, lowest graded player, right? We had, we had uh, Blake Martinez and Kyler Fackrell and Kevin King and whatnot. All the problems from before are still largely lingering, but all the bright spots just happen to be brand new additions. Again, like Jair, like Preston, like Amos, like Zadarius. Pretending this is just a terror. No, it, it was a bad team. I can tell you who the bad players were. It's the guys who were on defense the year before. Eliminate all the pieces that, and this is just 2019. It's not even 2020 when things continue to get better. How many good players are there on this defense if you don't include anybody that was brought in by Brian Gutekunst? It's Tremont and Kenny, and that's it. Two good players. That's it. Jair, Chandon Sullivan, Adrian Amos, Kadar Holman, and Zadarius Smith were all good graded out as good players, and every single one of them was brought in by a GM that just arrived, that just took over the reins. That doesn't even include Rashawn Gary, who hasn't broken out yet. And then in 2020, again, Jair, the number one corner in football. Adrian Amos, one of the number one uh, safeties, if not the number one safety in football. Zadarius Savage was our fifth best defender that year. Rashawn Gary started to improve. 46 pressures on 349 attempts and nine sacks in his limited snaps. 2020, offensively, what is the offensive line without our GM? You got David Bakhtiari, who's our left guard? It's Elton Jenkins. Who is our right uh, right guard? It's Lucas Patrick. Who's our right tackle? It's Rick Wagner. We had one of the best offensive lines in the entire NFL in 2020. Only two of them were holdovers. It was a completely rebuilt team. And yeah, Rodgers played out of his mind dominant football player, but he wasn't by himself. A.J. Dillon graded out higher than Aaron Jones that year. So it's just, it's just fake nonsense. It's just completely untrue. And it's, it's this incessant pretending that essentially 2020 and 2023 are identical football teams. The only difference is the quarterback, and this shows how bad things were. It's complete nonsense because we can look at it and see the performance. How's Jair doing compared to Jair? How's Kenny doing compared to Kenny? What, did, did did the quarterback make Jair better? Come on now. This is a good football team with good football players that have not figured out how to play good football right now. And I don't exactly know why. You have to look at the coaching to some degree. Obviously, injuries have played a big part in this. Rashawn is injured. Jair is injured. Elton Jenkins is injured. Everybody's battling through injuries. Aaron Jones is injured. Christian Watson's been constantly injured. That doesn't help things. Quay Walker and Devondre. I mean, just everybody. Everybody's all banged up and barely able to play. 2019. This is what I'm going to do here. 
Um, Talk to me, Deuce. But there were obvious problems. To the the team is weird, but and. All right, let me uh, search through this and see if there's any part that we can hear between this call and his next call. If there is, I'll play it. If not, Goose, I apologize. I tried my best. Just give me a minute to do my own search in here. Sounds like actually right after that, we kind of get cleared up a little bit. But, and yes, he dropped the Jordan Love instead of a wide receiver. I know so many people are so pissed off about that still. quarterback. The process was right. They should not have passed up on Jordan Love because they were possibly going to be in need of a quarterback in the near future. Here's a quarterback that has what they're looking for in the traits. Let's pick him up and see if he can do it. 2020, Rodgers wins the MVP. That team was amazing. Even 2021 was a lot better than people are given get credit for. You don't just lock into those teams. Yes, this year is not very good. It's good comes as he said in his press conference. But I believe that he has consistently drafted talented players. We've seen them come in and play well, show us their talent but they have not continued to progress. That's not on Gutekunst. That's not a Gutekunst problem. Ah, okay, squarely coaching stuff. That's the issue there. Because these guys have shown that they have the talent. Christian Watson blew up last year. We had people saying, oh, he's no good. You don't play that well on a hook. He played that well because he had the ability to be that good. The fact is that this team has a coaching problem. I'm not saying it's Matt LaFleur. I don't know. But good coach has done well by this team. I people don't like that he's a robot. But guess what? We would all suck as GMs. Every one of you that are criticizing him and saying he's awful, first – Go look at what other GMs have done and what their track record are. Who the comes to the top 10 GM? Second, you go run a team and see what will happen. I guarantee you, you will get laughed out of the NFL. We don't know. So. Yeah, Goose got cut off there. Um, look, I, I, again, some of, some of the conversations are a non-starter because I, I, if Jordan Love doesn't pan out, which again, as as seems to be the case right now, it's not looking great. The argument for me is not process; it's evaluation. But you got to also understand where I'm coming from, which is that the idea that evaluation can ever get anywhere close to a hundred percent is nonsense. There is always an element of here is the maximum we can actually know, and the rest is just a complete crapshoot. There is no amount of talent as far as evaluation that can bring you to the point where you know if somebody's going to be good or not. You don't know. You can just develop a process that brings you as close as possible to understanding the likelihood a player is going to be good, what their ceiling is, what their floor is, and you just kind of take swings. So there's a couple components. Number one is the process. Let's leave the talent out of it. Was there anything wrong with the process? I don't think that there is. Now, a lot of people do because they're, they're... all in on getting a wide receiver, whatever the case may be, which, you know, very unlikely that that even moves the needle, partially because it's unlikely they draft a good one. It's not a knock on Gutekunst. It's just if you look at the wide receivers, let's just say there were about five that were potential. Maybe one of them could have moved the needle. But beyond that, what you don't want is to be stuck in the situation that we're currently looking at, which is we don't have a quarterback. You don't want to be in this situation. And you know Rodgers is on the way out, which is another thing that just some some people refuse to acknowledge. Like, no, 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 he wasn't on the way. He could have played forever. He could play until he's 50. Like, okay, well, whatever. Again, it's just sort of non-starters here. If we can't at least agree on the process part of it, then, then there's not much else to discuss. All I'll say is I lean toward the way that the Packers do things. I lean toward the process, which says quarterback is the most important position in football. I lean toward protecting your future and not just focusing on the present. And if we disagree, we disagree. And, and you know, hopefully at, at some point for your sake, 
you get a GM that's much more now focused and you know is a little bit more wild and reckless and goes out and just spends all the money constantly all in mode no matter what. I mean, you're not going to be satisfied with it. You'll like it at the time. And then when it doesn't work, you get to piss and moan about how he didn't do it right. I swear NFL fans are all just a bunch of communists. <laughs> like, yeah, it's never worked, but it would work if you just do it the way I say. Yeah, I supported it, but not like that. Like the way that like the theory comes to fruition and it actually works and everything's great. Like that utopia vision. Do it the utopian way, not the way where everybody dies and starves to death. Like, come on. That, that, that's, that's the way, bro. That's how it goes. You lose. And again, as far as the evaluation, I mean, it, it's a miss. I mean, I don't, okay, I, I shouldn't say that. It's potentially a miss. And if it is, then then that's just, it's it's a miss. Like, you know, sometimes there's hits, sometimes there's misses. But you have to at least have the baseline intelligence to understand that there is no 100% hit rate. That includes the first round. And that drafting is more about process than anything else. Which, yes, that would mean essentially Jordan Love, process-wise, is a better pick than Quay Walker. But that doesn't mean, you know, again, it's like the the blackjack example I always give. If you hit on a 20 and get an ace, that doesn't mean that hitting on a 20 is a good idea. You know, and it's like, well, I got a 12, I think I'm going to stay. It's like, no, bro, you got you should hit that. Well, what if it's a 10? It's like, well, you're not going to win with a 12. So what do you do? You hit, it's a 10, you bust, it's like, see, I shouldn't listen to you. You don't know what you're talking about. Like, okay, well, listen... All there is is process. There's no way to know the future. But if you follow the system, if you follow the process and know when to hit, when to split, when to fold or hold, it's the only chance you have at success in a system that's rigged for you to lose, which is what the draft is, because most of the people in that pile are not good NFL football players. And so you're going into it relatively blind. You do you get as much information as you possibly can, which could maybe bring you up to like 20% of knowledge, which means 80%, and I'm making this up, but this is just generally how I view it, 80% is completely random and unknown. And so what do you do? Because you can't rely on evaluation, you have to, I mean, you have to push evaluation as hard as you possibly can, but it's not a reliable tool if you're only talking 20%. So process becomes much more important than the evaluation piece, even if some GMs don't want to admit that because they think that they're all knowing with their evaluation or scouts or you know, wannabe scouts on social media. So I don't have an issue with process. I do have an issue issue to some degree with evaluation. But the the problem with that, aside from, I mean, everything that I've said is, was it generally viewed as a good value? And the answer is yes, despite everyone saying, no, it's not. It's a second round pick, which even if it was, so what? So was Jalen Hurts. But again, the consensus was not that. And I promise you, there was more than one team that had him as a first round pick. And I'm, I'm willing to bet that there was almost nobody Somewhere between almost nobody and nobody that had him as a third round pick. So even on the evaluation piece, it's not like the Packers got it wrong. They understood what all the other teams understood. They understand the strengths. They understand the weaknesses. And again, when you look at it, it really does line up. He's got a really high ceiling. He has a lot of things that he needs to work on, but he's going to have time to sit with a quarterback coach as your head coach and Aaron Rodgers to be able to teach you stuff, to learn from, to watch play. It's not a bad swing. Could be a miss, 100%, but... It all lines up for me. Certainly is a risk. I mean, the easy way to take out is to just go for a wide receiver. If you want to just make the fans happy, get a wide receiver every year. Wide receiver, tight end, running back, whatever. You'll never be wrong if you do that in the first round. Everybody will love you. Everybody will gush all over what you're doing. Go get the offensive playmakers. So again, I'm, I'm willing to listen to some stuff, but I've, I've settled on certain things. And there are certain things that are just, again, non-starters because we just don't agree fundamentally on how things work. And holding a GM to 100% success rate and looking at, you know, if, if you think you can present to me guys that missed as evidence that he's a bad GM, then I don't think you're very good at this. And there's really nothing for us to discuss because it would be a waste of time for me to even go to the next level of demonstrating to you how every GM has massive amounts of misses. It's not even worth it because if you can't come to that conclusion by yourself, this is this is a fruitless exercise having having some kind of a debate or argument with you. So essentially, it just comes down to philosophy. If you have a different philosophy, which I'm, if I'm being completely honest, I think the vast majority of people that don't like Gutekunds don't really have a philosophy. The philosophy is, I want you to be good. And it doesn't matter if you followed the right process and failed. You failed, therefore you suck. I want you to follow the process where you pick good players and then win football games. Which, again, the problem with that is that that person doesn't exist. Not to say there aren't better evaluators and people that have better process and things of that nature. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying you you have to have a general philosophy on how you want the team to run, how you want things. So in other words, you can say prior to, 
not just after the fact. If all you do is look after the fact and say it should have been better, you're not, we, we can't converse about this. What we should do, what would be much more interesting and entertaining would be looking at 2024 and saying, here's my vision for the future. And, and w- not, not where I depart from good in the past, because you can just make up whatever. I, I would have taken, you know, this great wide receiver. I would have taken this great player. Okay, great. Wonderful. You would have been a perfect evaluator. Got it. Only person in human history. Going into the future, what's the plan? And I, I, honestly, that would be fun to, to try to think of different um, ways of viewing the team, ways of uh, different philosophies on building a roster and how that works and, and how that would materialize in the future. I think that's a fun discussion. But sitting back and pissing and moaning about the things aren't as good as I want them to be, therefore fire Goot, just not interesting to me. And I'm not saying that's what everybody's doing, um, but I do think it's most of them. And to those of you that it's not, again, the interest, interesting discussion for me is what is your philosophy, how does it differ, and what does that look like moving forward? Anyways, let's take a break. Sorry that I'm rambling so much. We got one more call from Goose, and then we'll we'll keep on rocking. Uh, Patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy, or hit me up on Venmo at Packernet Podcast. Thank you all very much for your support. We'll be right back. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's us days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. This podcast is brought to you by AT&T Fiber with AllFi. Something tells me that the guy watching sports for 13 hours straight on Sunday, who then stays up watching the recaps of those 13 hours, then calls his friends to talk about it, is definitely going to notice that half a second delay. Get AT&T Fiber with All Fight and watch sports any time of day from anywhere in your house. Live like a gagillionaire. Limited availability in select areas. Go to att.com slash hypergig to check eligibility. Coverage may require extenders at additional charge. This episode is brought to you by PwC. When unprecedented times are all the time, it's time to start walking the talk. Leaders like you turn to PwC to see and stay ahead. Upskill your workforce, use intelligent automation, and transform big ideas into breakthrough reinvention. Explore the human-led tech-powered solutions that help you reinvent. It's all part of the new equation. Learn more at pwc.com. Focus Features presents the American Society of Magical Negroes. Come again? A secret society tasked with making the world a more peaceful place. What's the most dangerous animal on the planet? Sharks. White people. Because the happier they are, the safer we are. Wow, that is troubling. But their newest recruit will change everything. It's always my job to make white people feel comfortable. It shouldn't be. Not according to my grandma. Oh, you're going to quote your wise black grandma to me? <laughs> the American Society of Magical Negroes. Ready PG-13. May be inappropriate for children under 13. Only in theaters this Friday. Got cut off by the three minute monster. That's yeah, all right, man. But what I was saying is, we don't know. It just. Pause. All right, continue. Hunts is an amazing talent scout. He has made some questionable calls in his management. Yeah, and I, I there's a lot of stuff. I mean, first of all, he has very rarely picked players that I like. Um, but I can't hold that against him because that would mean that I hold myself in high regard, right? So it's kind of an irrelevant thing. I mean, it would be cool if I had a GM that like picked all the guys that I like because that would be kind of cool. Um, watching the Notre Dame game. I, I, I was trying to figure out what game to watch to figure out what prospect I want to watch. And I'm like, you know what? I want to watch some Joe Alt. So that's what I'm doing right now. But anyways, again, it, it would be great if for my sake, if I like the same guys that he liked and it panned out. But it, it's not it's not a basis for for how to judge a GM, you know? So again, I'm, I'm open. I just haven't heard anything that's interesting, I guess. I think he did mess up the Rogers situation. He should have either traded him when Rogers wanted to trade it, or he should have let him walk at, let the contract run out. He shouldn't have signed the new contract, but that's fine. So, Paused the wrong one. He said that's hindsight, and that that's that's my whole point. If you look at it from a process standpoint, it's not bad. If you look at it from 
like a a hindsight standpoint, it, it obviously turned out terribly. Again, we've, we've talked about this a thousand times. The guy wins back-to-back MVPs. You can't walk away from that. I mean, that you didn't know it was going to happen, but it happened. You change your process, right? When you're looking at a team that's knocking on the door of a Super Bowl with a back-to-back MVP, how you handle your team, your quarterback, etc., is going to be different than in 2023 with a quarterback that's shown nothing and a team that can't do anything right, and you act accordingly. Now, look, I mean, at the if we turn this around and we get into the playoffs and all of a sudden everything is wonderful, then suddenly the Razul thing was a bad idea. But it's only bad in hindsight. It's not bad looking right now. That's the point. I don't give a crap how good you are at, at predicting the past. <laughs> That's not a trait that I find necessarily impressive. It's about what is the right thing to do right now given the information that we already have. You cannot use information that's in the future because you haven't seen it yet. The other thing I put on through the comes that he definitely got wrong is how he handled the Adams situation. He got that way wrong. Without a question, that was really poorly handled, and that is on through the comes. Um, I know people are mad he's sticking with Myers. I personally don't like Myers, but I do agree with your argument. Myers is a good pass blocker. He is. And that's the number one. I mean, the, the, the bottom line is, to everybody that's pissing and moaning about Myers, the situation could very easily get worse because the vast majority of the players in the NFL right now, starting centers, are not as good as Josh Myers. So, I mean, you can, you can be upset. You can be upset about everybody. Go, go cry about Jair Alexander. I mean, this is first world problems. This this is this is the biggest pile of crap ever. Like, oh, Jair's not good enough. Bro, <laughs> Jair on a bad day is better than most corners out there in the NFL. There's just no perspective anywhere. It's as though we didn't watch Ladarius Gunter play corner for us, and we watch Jair now. It's like, well, that's not good enough. He's not the number one guy anymore. I guess he sucks. Like, what is wrong with you people? Josh Myers, oh, he's a good pass blocker. Yeah, but he can't run. Who gives a crap? Oh, my goodness. What did I say? There's three centers in the entire NFL that have a good pass blocking and run blocking rate. But that's what you demand. Otherwise, he's he's unstartable. You have no idea what bad football players look like. I mean, genuinely no idea. But maybe we'll just erase the GM and go find somebody else that's not as good at their job. They'll abandon the process that has gotten the Green Bay Packers to where they are for as long as they have. And we can go be the Cleveland Browns. We can be the New York Jets. We can be the the whatever, all these teams that have been bad forever. And then you'll find out what bad football players really look like. You'll find out what bad drafting really looks like. This is spoiled Packer fan syndrome. Not good enough. It's a freaking center, first of all. We got a quarterback that can't throw a football and we're going to sit here and nitpick about a, about a center? Because what? You want to run the ball better? Yeah, that's how you win. That's how you do it. That's how you win football games. What is this, 1963? This is what we have to spend all our time whining about? The best pat, one of the best pass blocking offensive lines in the entire NFL. And we got to spend all our time talking about a freaking center because he's a subpar run blocker. What a freaking waste of everybody's time. Jeez. Thing that a player needs to be if they're on the offensive line. The problem is Myers just seems to make mental errors all over the place and is a horrendous run blocker. He's got to be able to bring that up to at least the average in the high 50s. Yeah, I mean, I, I would like for him to get back to what he was last year, which I think that's what it was. He was mid-50s as a run blocker. And honestly, he's had two games that have been like below that standard all year. Chicago and Denver, he was in the 40s. That's it. Two games. He's been 50s and 60s every other game outside of that. Which again, I know that's not ideal, but I'm just, I'm so tired of talking about such a minor problem. Here, here, here's the situation we're in. Take Josh Myers out of the equation. Go get the best center that Green Bay has ever had. Put him in there. Guess what? Our team doesn't win a single game more. So, you know, it, it's not even, it's not even necessarily an argument in favor of Josh Myers to say that. It's just to say, who gives a crap? Like, fine, fine, replace him. Congratulations, you fixed the world. This is not worth spending months talking about. I'm not talking about you, Goose. It's just like we're, we're hammering so hard at the most irrelevant things in the world. We're having a battle about Josh Myers. Who gives a crap? On the list of priorities to fix this team, Josh Myers is one of the lowest. 
It's not even the highest on the offensive line. We need a left tackle. We very likely need a new coach, a new quarterback. And we're going to talk about the center? Come on, man. Fine, fine. Change the center. Whatever. I, I, it's, I don't even want to freaking talk about it anymore. Who gives a crap? They're looking at the entire team just continually being a mess and then saying, well, that's got to be the GM. It's the GM's fault because they have had their feelings hurt because they are a Rogers apostle. They are anti-goot right from the get-go because of he doesn't pick the guys that they want. Or because suddenly these guys like Jair, who have been superstars in the past, are not playing up to that level. The truth is, he has got. Well, that, and that, again, that's the part I don't understand. Like we're just pretending that the past doesn't matter. We're pretending that the guys that have established themselves as good football players who are struggling, most of which either are not really struggling, like Josh Myers is not struggling nearly as much as people are portraying. Or Jair, who's played like three games and has been injured all year. Or what? Like Aaron Jones, who's been injured? I mean, he's not playing super well, but nobody's even talking about that. A.J. Dillon? You know, like, it's just all of a sudden we're supposed to pretend like all this talent isn't talent. And the GM's trash because he drafted terrible players. Like, wait, wait a minute. Why are they all of a sudden terrible players? I don't understand. So Devontae Wyatt is one of the best pass-rushing defensive tackles in football right now. Rashawn Gary is one of the best edge rushers in football right now. Jair Alexander has never been anything other than a good corner and is having a down year because he has a back injury. We still have a premier offensive line in the most important thing. Like last week, we, we, there were the, the offensive line, the pass blocking was like 54 snaps compared to like 14 run blocking snaps. Like, eh, I'm not going to say it doesn't matter because it does, but come on, you're trying to be ridiculous when you overlook a premier pass-blocking offensive line and try to pretend that it's terrible because of a couple clips of guys making mistakes on run plays. We've seen the talent of the wide receivers, but it's not being unveiled, in my opinion, largely because of the quarterback. We've had multiple walk-in touchdowns. Like week one, Musgrave could have had like two touchdowns and 150 yards, but the passes were off target. There were two, at least two, massive plays to Watson in this last game that didn't happen because of terrible passes. Yeah, there were four drops in the game. That's true. There were way more opportunities missed because of, because of Jordan Love. But I'm supposed to sit back and just say, yeah, everybody sucks? Why? Because the team's struggling? Why are we just getting crazy with stuff? I don't understand that. I'm a lot of talent on this team, and I think it's the coaching that is holding them back because how else to explain guys who have been the best in the NFL are not playing to that level anymore? It's not because Goot picked bad players. That's not who it comes. He wasn't wrong to give them contracts. They earned those contracts. And the expectation was that they keep playing that way. And there was no indication that they wouldn't. They're just mad that he's not perfect. And that's the problem. Well, and how many players are massive liabilities? Like, we, we all thought safety was going to be a big thing. That really hasn't been a problem all year. I, I haven't really had a problem with any of the safeties. Savage, I thought, has been fine. Rudy Ford has been, I think, fantastic, all things considered. The corners haven't been a massive problem. I mean, the coverage in general isn't great, but I think you have to wonder about Joe Barry's um, abilities as a defensive coordinator to some degree, which, again, comes down to you have talent that's not being... I, I, I can't imagine there are too many more teams that PFF grades really highly a bunch of players and has less production based. I mean, they should make a metric. Least production based on talent. I mean, is it the linebackers you don't like? The corners? I mean, I know razul has gone, but I mean, Razul was good to Gutekun's credit. So we had Razul, we had Jair, and Keyshawn wasn't great, but as far as like a number, I mean, that was a good corner group. I mean, the run defense isn't great, but the defensive line in the most important aspects of pass rush has been phenomenal. The offensive line, as far as pass blocking, has been phenomenal. Like what? What is the massive thing you look at Gutekunz other than just to just very shallowly look at it and say we're bad? It's Gutekunz's team, therefore it's his fault. I just I can't see it. What's the thing we're looking at? Going man, this is just a disaster of a football team. Like in 2018, that was a disaster. You're looking at washed up Clay Matthews, do nothing Nick Perry, 
you did have the makings of what was about to be good football players, but like Jair wasn't really even a starter necessarily. He just got drafted. You know, Blake Martinez and Oren Burks and you know, Justin McCray, Jimmy Graham, Jamal Williams was our starting running back at the time. Kevin King at corner, Kensho Bryce and Haha Clinton Dix at safety. Had Geronimo Allison as our number two wide receiver. Like these are guys where you look at it and go, this isn't going to be a thing. You either got guys like Clay who are past their prime and it's not going to be a thing ever. Or guys like Geronimo where it's like, you're just filling in until we can find somebody better. And I feel like 2017 was like the all-time low, which was the official last year of, you know, Ted Thompson. But dude, we had like Jari Evans, Martellus Bennett, obviously Brett Hundley, but that was just part of the issue. Ty Montgomery was our number one running back. Clay and Perry with Jake Ryan and Blake Martinez. We had Devon House and Demarius Randall at corner. I mean, nobody's looking at this team saying, man, they just had some better coaching. None of these guys had ever demonstrated anything. So, I don't know. Whatever. What's up, Ryan? It's Aaron from Eau Claire. I just wanted to um, give a quick call because I was um, reading about Rasul Douglas and how Brian Gutekunst called him. And he thought it was a prank that they were trading him and hung up on him. And uh, I don't know. I've always been on Team Gutekunst, but uh, not quite sure what to make of all of it. I uh, I feel that the fan base is not going to be very happy in many cases about trading not only some, one of their players who was really good, but that was also kind of a beloved figure. Um, so we'll see if uh, this blows over or if it kind of snowballs into more criticism and more of a hot seat for Brian Gutekunst over the next season or two. Um, um, myself, I don't know how it was addressed, but uh, if I was a player, it would be pretty crazy to to think that you could get traded at any time without any prior warning. So, anyways, um, that's what I got to say. Yeah, I mean the the fans aren't going to like it, and the the players aren't going to like it. But that's not the question. The question is. What is the right thing to do, and do you have the frickin' balls to do it? Despite the fact that the players aren't going to like you, they're not going to be happy, they're going to complain, they're going to think you're an evil, horrible person, the fan base is going to be mad that you gave away a player that was really good, That's that needs to be immaterial to you, right? It doesn't matter. Uh, the, the Again, the question is, was it the right thing to do? And um, I guess that depends on your position on this football team if you think that this is a team that um can kind of pick things up and and figure things out then maybe we should have held on to them if you think maybe we're just a player away get a wide receiver and a new center and everything's fixed then you should probably hang on to them if you're thinking it's time to tear this thing down it's not urgent that you get rid of him but you understand he's not a part of our our future here and you get an offer for him which you presume to be above market value so you pull the trigger how the fans feel is, in my opinion, irrelevant. It's one of the better aspects of not having an owner is they don't have to care. Owners sometimes worry about what the fans think. I hope Mark Murphy doesn't. Now, if he's doing a bad job and he doesn't approve of the job, he should fire Brian Gutekunst, no question. But otherwise, who gives a crap? Who cares? You're the bad guy. Oh, well, be the bad guy. And he's willing to be the bad guy. And that's, I appreciate that. He's willing to take the frickin' arrows to do what he thinks is best to save the franchise and turn it around as quickly as is possible. And you got to remember, I mean, keeping Razul is, is about self-preservation too. Gutekunst's number one priority, if we're being honest, is his job. And that's what makes some GMs bad at their job. Because if you're worried about, you know, keeping your job, the easiest thing to do is to try to win as many games as you can. Keep Razul, maybe buy when you should be selling, try to inflate your numbers a little bit, Make it look like you're doing a better job than, than make it look like things are better than what they are. And he's willing to take a hard left turn and smash this thing right into a wall and say we're doing a teardown, knowing full well that it's possible that the guy above his head might say, you know what, I'm not sure I want you to be the guy to do the rebuild. But it's the right thing to do, so he's going to do it. And again, it's possible he's wrong that it's the right thing to do, but the fact that he's willing to do it in and of itself is a positive. Anyways, let's take our final break. We'll come back and do some more calls. David's Bridal, where brides and bridesmaids get fabulously dressed. We let our friends pick out what we wear. 
show off our dance moves, obsess over every little detail, hold your hand through it all, smile bravely when it's time to let go, make your dreams come true. The things we do for love, only at David's Bridal. This episode is brought to you by Skinny Pop Popcorn. Perfectly popped, endlessly delicious. Oh, so light and crunchy. Skinny Pop Original Popcorn is the snack you've been searching for. Made with just three simple ingredients, popcorn kernels, sunflower oil, and salt. Snacking never felt or tasted so good. Perfectly popped, endlessly delicious. Give yourself permission to snack and pick up Skinny Pop Original Popcorn today. Start your electric journey right here, right now. With a Volvo XC90 Recharge, our plug-in hybrid SUV with extended range. For more everyday electric journeys on a single charge with a hybrid option for longer adventures. Contact your local retailer to book a test drive or design your own vehicle at volvocars.com slash US. The Volvo XC90 Recharge Plug-in Hybrid. The electric car with a backup plan. Gold Bond sabe que tu piel cambia constantemente, como despertar sintiéndola hidratada y terminar con la piel seca después de caminar en un día frío. O tener una piel opaca en el trabajo al lucir una piel radiante en una cita en la noche. Las personas no tienen solo una piel, tienen pieles. Y las fórmulas clínicamente probadas de las lociones Gold Bond cuentan con 7 humectantes nutritivos y 3 vitaminas para ayudarte a cuidarlas. Para todas tus pieles Gold Bond, visita goldbond.com para más información. Hey, Ryan, Steve up in Alaska, hey. calling you on a nice, brisk, clear, blue sky day. Um, just got some stuff done, you know, put a few hours in every day, you know, get a little something done. Nice. That way you don't got to overwork yourself. But I'm out doing my exercise and listening to the podcast. And figure it, I hadn't called in for a while. <laughs> Myself, I know a few other people have saying the same thing because we're all dealing with the, the doldrums of a bad season. But uh, I'd like to congratulate you on doing a, uh, an excellent job of maintaining when, you know, everything's down and, and not completely going sour ball. And, well, thank you. Uh, I also like to uh, say that I agree with your uh, comments about the uh, the position that Mark Murphy got or is in in terms of what he might be looking towards to do to to get the team back on track. Um, yeah, with, with two years ago, I think that's that Budenkunst's his chance, his opportunity to see if he can do something. Otherwise, you know, whoever it is, if it's Carmen Policy or somebody else that comes in and replace Mark Murphy, um, that guy's probably going to replace Gutenkunz because, you know, you're in charge. You want to have your own people in there. So this is his opportunity. Um, I think with the way the team's going, I hope, I hope I'm crossing my fingers. I know it seems terrible to say, but I hope we don't have a, a, a fall apart season like we did last year where we were terrible and then we kind of strung it together right. just enough to ruin our draft position. Right. Um, I remember the last time we were bad like this would have been, uh, late Brett Favre's career. Uh, that's the draft where we got BJ Raji. I think it was the number six overall pick because we were, we had, too, right? what, four wins that year? Um, we got, yeah, BJ Raji and Clay Matthews because we got to trade up because our second round draft pick was so high because we were so bad. Yeah. And so we got some real talent on that draft. Um, but I think it's just, you know, we're just in a position where we're going to have to reset ourselves. I think the whole team needs to reset. Um, I was glad to see that, you know, there was effort to trade off some players. I know everybody said we didn't do enough. We should have done more. But there is the off season. You know, all the way up until draft day, players are tradable. You know, so we got an opportunity that I'm sure that's probably part of the, the thing they're looking at is we can see if some of these guys can turn their season around, which in turn kind of screws us in the draft. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I mean, what can you say? It's a bad year. You know, it's just a bad year. You just kind of have to look at it and, like you say, look for the shining points. You know, look for the things that we can do to change things. I think it'll be good to be able to revamp a lot of things. And we'll have good draft picks and we'll have commodities to work with. So, new coach, that's probably on the table. Who knows about the GM? But after all that, my time's about up. Talk to you later, Ryan. Go back. Always appreciate your calls, man. I I'll be honest. As soon as you mentioned that year, whatever year that was, um, 
I've been thinking, how do we replicate that? Because we do have, you know, the second round picks and everything, and we'll have a high second round pick if we have, you know, our bad at football and whatnot. So I was like, how do we get a BJ Raji and a Clay Matthews? And I'm like, well, that would be what, Jerzon Newton? And then we trade back up into the first round to get Braylon Trice out of Washington, maybe the edge rusher. I mean, we we don't need to do that. What would be maybe this year's version of that? Like a super important because you could still do Jerzon Newton for sure if you wanted to. What if we did Joe Alt at six and we trade up in the first and we get Cameron Kitchens, the safety? How about them apples? Hey, Ryan, this is Rich. Hey. Um, three things. So first of all is to say I really appreciate all of the work you're doing, especially through the uh, difficult times here. Thank you. I think it's important to note that uh, Twitter is a cesspool. and yeah. A lot of us don't go there. I don't go there. Um, I understand you got to go there for a lot of your content, but that's not how um, everybody feels. You don't know why you got cut off there, but yeah, I, I um, it kind of felt like that's where you go. I mean, it's where you get like breaking news, but any relevant Green Bay Packers news I can find elsewhere. And honestly, sometimes I miss some big stuff because it's so cluttered on there that there's like bigger news that I'll find out after I did the podcast. Like, holy crap, I didn't even. Like, uh, I think when Stokes went to IR or something, like I, I, I did a podcast and then I found out after, like, how did I miss that? But, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not really, I don't have to go on there. I think there's some more nuanced things and you can kind of get an idea like what people are saying and where the conversations are, which is good for the podcast. Cause if it's what people want to talk about, it makes sense to, to comment on it. But, um, yeah, I, I think it's become so unhealthy that it's better to maybe just not engage and just give my opinions and be completely oblivious to what people's opinions on things are. So I can just assume most people agree with me and just continue on and just, you know, assume it's just a very, no big deal. Just like, here's what I think. And I'm sure nobody's going to overreact and get super ticked off about it. And that'll be fine. Kind of the direction I'm heading anyways. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to stay off and I'm, I'm doing a pretty good job the last few days. Hey, Ryan, this is Nico, chilling on my balcony. Um, so I, I don't know if I told you this, but, you know, I had my choice to go to either the Lions game or the Chargers game, and I picked the Lions game. The right. biggest reason was, at that point, even my optimism would still be high in the sky, and, uh, you know, it was like, we, we got a chance. If I was going to the Charger game, I wouldn't be as optimistic, so I, plus it was, it was sunny, it was warm, it was peak of winter color, like fall colors, almost peak fall colors, it was beautiful. Me and my buddy walked downtown and just had fun all night the night before, you know, it was just warm. Uh, but here's one of the worst things about losing that Thursday night game against the Lions. Um, <clears throat> I had brought with me my long sleeve, dark green, Packernet podcast shirt that I bought like back in 2018, yeah. um, but I lived in Cali. And had we won, me and my buddy Wayne, we're going to go stand. You know, there's always the Thursday night wrap-up crew, and there's always the cameras pointing to the audience. I was going to stand there cheering like a fool with this big old pack in it. Yes, with sir. With this pack daddy right in the center. Mm. I was going to be pointing at it, screaming, and, and, and since we lost, I couldn't do it because I didn't want to be <laughs> the only Packer fan there because it was such a brutal. I get it. So that's, that's really fine. the worst part about losing. I couldn't give you free uh, advertisement, so I'm sorry about that. But, um... You know, you just made a comment to uh, to Joe, the janitor, um, and uh, it's, it, it is kind of amazing. This crappy we've been playing to the little talent as we have on the team. People keep saying we have a ton of talent, at least ostensibly, and I'll believe it when I see it. But uh, as, as bad as we, I think offensively, there's more questions than defensively. There's more, you know, on defense, it's like, I know it's there because I've seen it. And it's possible that maybe it just all vanished. Everybody's talent just vanished at the same time, inexplicably. Um, and that has nothing to do with the situation we're in or the coaching or the scheme or the environment and the locker room or any of that. It's just a big, massive coincidence where a talent bomb went off and everybody just started playing bad. On offense, though, it's, it's like, I kind of believe like, I like Watson. Do I think he's a, a true number one? Probably not. But I think he's a dangerous weapon that isn't really fully being utilized, partially due to his, you know, injuries, which are constant. And then this year, 
it's it's honest. I mean, again, I just think it's the quarterback. You know, Rodgers didn't go to him very much, but when he did, it was it, they were in sync, and it was a beautiful thing. And they were starting to shred the NFL. We need somebody that can connect with him. Dobbs seems a little bit more spotty. I like Dobbs. Do I think he's a true number one? Probably not. But I think he's a decent, solid receiver that you know at times can kind of take over some stuff. Reed, I have no idea. I like Reed. I see the upside. I have a feeling he's going to be similar to Dobbs and Watson, where I'm I'm guessing I'm not going to be like, this dude is a legit number one, but can he be a solid slot option? I think so. But it's again, it's hard to know because nothing's really working right now. You know, partially you got drops, you got guys running wrong routes, you got the timing is off, you've got the, the chemistry's not there, you got again bad quarterback play. I don't know. Same with Musgrave. Not seeing it for all the same reasons. I have a, some level of optimism. But I don't know. I, I can't say that I know they're because they've never demonstrated it. Watson is the only one that kind of showed like what his upside can be, and it's through the roof. Everybody else, it seems more in line with just kind of decent. So I'm I'm relatively optimistic that at least some of these pieces are going to be valuable to some degree, and some of them I'm sure are not going to pay off. That's just how things work. Not everybody's going to be a hit. But you know, again, offensively, I'm I'm not going to sit here and say I know anything, but. Um, I like what we have. I like the offensive line. Pass blocking offensive line is incredibly important. It's one of the best ones in football. Quarterback has not been up to par. I mean, literally not even average. Um, And the receivers, I mean, they haven't done anything magical, but I'm waiting to see, you know, I just, it it would be nice if when they're running wide open down the field, the ball just kind of got thrown into their hands, you know, not like, oh, I have to stop and come back. And now there's two defenders here and it's like a Hail Mary in the middle of the field kind of thing. That crap needs to stop. Um, So, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. Maybe next year. Kind of been in most games. It's like we're just a few funny bounces, the hop skipping away, maybe a call not called here and there, a receiver catching a ball away from being having four wins, you know? So uh, it's, we're not that far off, and uh, we're all doom and gloom, and the sky's falling, and we're all aiming a gun on our forehead. You know what? This I am actually having a good year. Only yeah. because I, the last 30 years, usually by this time of the season, I was like in massive panic. Oh, my God, we can't lose anymore. Oh, my God, they got to lose. Now I'm just enjoying every game mm-hmm. and just, I mean, I want to see some growth. I'm anticipating seeing some growth at some point. I, I know, I still think at some point in time, it might be a while that those stuff will start flowing, the rookies will start catching balls, you know, the offensive line will gel a little better. Oh, no, we're getting close to three minutes now. It does take a lot of pressure off. I mean, it's unfortunate how negative everything has become, which just kind of takes some of the fun out of it. But um, again, I think for you, for me, for a lot of people, and that's why I just need to stay off social media and just hang out with people that are having a good time, which is for the most part, all you people, which is great. So we'll just hang out, have a good time. Um, Obviously winning is more fun, but, but again, it, I think it is fun. I I get to relax and enjoy a game and um, you know, I mean, you get to be disappointed, but there isn't that massive panic of like, we have to be perfect or it's horrible, at least from my perspective. Um, the only kind of disagreement I would have is that we're close because I don't think so. We're, we're close to winning, but not really close to being good. I think if, if it had bounced a, a little bit differently and we ended up winning the game, it would be sort of kind of like how 2022 started, where it's like, even when you win, you're looking at it going, this doesn't feel right. Like it's not clicking. Um, and you just don't really feel good about the wins necessarily. And then the losses follow. And that's kind of where we're at. I think, you know, we got the wins, but it's like, that was clunky, but Hey, we figured it out. And then when the losses started piling up, it's kind of like, yeah, that sort of makes sense actually. So I don't want to say I'm glad we didn't win necessarily, but had we had won based on, you know, a call here or there, or a play here or there, a drop, whatever, three interceptions, you know, that kind of stuff. I don't know that I would have necessarily felt good about it. It would have just we would have just been kind of a fraud team, I think, is is how I would have felt about it. But I guess I'm glad that that didn't happen because it would be even worse if we were winning and I was being negative and then it would just be annoying. But I would have to be honest and, you know, it's 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 just it's better this way. <laughs> I don't want to have to complain about winning. But I feel like they'll put some stuff together. And with this young crew, they still haven't ruled out Jordan. I know he's got a lot of negative stuff, but 
You know, a lot of there's a yeah, there's been a few quarterbacks that come in and are awesome, but there's been plenty that need two, three, four years. This is year one for him. Say what you want, it's year one. Um, so uh, you had a lot to hope on him, but I'm just kind of enjoying watching this team and nobody's go out there and do stuff. Now last year, some people popped. Lawson popped, you know. Um, Dobbs popped a little beginning of the season. Lawson popped, you know, after week ten. That still could happen, you know. Maybe yeah. Musgrave will just say screw it. Maybe they'll. Man, I wish they would use him over the middle. Gosh. Uh, now they did just trade Razul. I don't. I don't get what's going on there. Um, seem to be the that's Gutekunst disagreeing with you vehemently is what <laughs> is what that is. One defensive guy that was solid was a team leader. Uh, so I don't know. I don't even know what to say about that. But uh, and they got a third round pick. A third round? I'd rather get two fourth round picks. Yeah, I get it. Oh, maybe we can trade that third round pick to move up in the first round. Who knows? If that's the case, and we get someone good, yeah, I'm with it because it is what it is. You know, uh, people come and go, and he seems like isn't that how we got Savage or something? We traded a third round pick to go up in the first. I know there was one pick that we had made. Where we traded a third. Maybe that was to go back up and get Jair or something. It was like a third round pick. I can't exactly remember. Great guy. I'll, I'll follow him forever. Now I'll just root for the Bills to win the Super Bowl. Whatever. Yeah, dude, for sure. So, um, it's, I, it's just kind of like a, a, a year of optimism. Still kind of waiting for the optimism. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll run this season. We'll flush out some, some, uh, poopy head in the off season. And, uh, we'll see what we got next year. Mm-hmm. You never know. I think we're going to have a little more cap room next year, I think. So uh, just always got to be optimistic. Still love the Packers. And um, if it takes them three or four years to get good, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to watch it. I'm going to watch every game, and I'm going to be positive. And by the way, the ribs they had on Sunday were just perfect. I pulled them right before they became just completely mushy because I like the little snap to my ribs. I don't want them to be too fall off the bony. But man, they were good. I'm actually going to make some macaroni and cheese with the leftovers mm. tonight. So, uh, cause that's amazing. So, hey, uh, <clears throat> cheer up, Pack fans. It's not all over. And, uh, you know, we're, we'll slowly get some stuff together. And we'll, whatever slowly rises to the top, we'll keep that. We'll get rid of the chase. You know, and maybe we'll get some more stuff rising to the top next year. Maybe we can sign a free agent or two next year because we really couldn't this year. So, uh, hey, uh, all we can do is look up, and uh, let's hope Rashawn Gary plays better from now on. Peace. Go Pack Go. Yeah, I mean, I, I again, I would almost be shocked if this level of bad play continues forever. I do think some things are going to start to c- come together, um, but that's me being mostly pessimistic. I Like some people have said, I genuinely believe that they're going to string together several wins. I think this week very possibly is a win, especially if their quarterback doesn't play, which is starting to look like he might not. Which is, I mean, if we barely beat this team by playing terror, I'm just going to be pissed. Like, that is, I know most people would be fine with it, just get a win, I just want to watch a win. But the worst, absolute worst case scenario is play like garbage. Play like your worst game this year, but win the game. It's like, you, you just, you screwed the draft, you suck at football. Like, this is the worst. So, my my whole thing is, either lose the game or win in a way that says we're learning, we're figuring it out. You know, I mean, the, the best case scenario isn't to win. The best case scenario is Jordan Love lights that freaking game up and plays like a top 10 quarterback and just makes a statement to the rest of the league. That would be the absolute best case scenario. Second best case scenario, just freaking keep on going down this path. Just make sure you lose the game, keep on trucking. Anything in between is garbage. But anyways, I'm going to leave you with that. You guys have a good rest of your night. I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye. Uh, bye. Ah, mmm. The first taste of rare bourbon you finally got your hands on. That's nice. At Caskers.com, we make this experience easy. Caskers is a one-stop spirit curator with an impressive selection of exclusive sought-after rare and household names in the realm of premium spirits and champagne. Discover the top flavors of the year now by going to Caskers.com and using code WELCOME10 for $10 off your first purchase. Get $10 off your first purchase with code WELCOME10 at Caskers.com.